see his glory come down. We just love being in your presence, Lord. That's the cry of our soul, to be more and more in your presence. To have more of you and less of us. And that having less of us, Lord, we just need your help to give up ourselves. To be sold out to you and not take you back. To be that holy temple that you've desired from the beginning when you walked with Adam every day. But you desired that Adam would grow up to be your temple, that you could live in Adam the way you want to live in us. We do desire, O Lord, to be that holy temple, a church without spot or wrinkle, a holy church without blemish, living in your presence and having your presence living inside us. O oh Lord, how we desire to be in your presence every hour of every day, every day of every year, every year until you return. And from then on, we'll always be in your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you're preparing us. You're taking us from that miry clay and moving us up to be adults in your family with glorified bodies, bodies filled with the glory of God, bodies sold out to you, hearts, soul, minds, all sold out to you, all focused on you. Oh Lord, we do desire to be in your presence. And we understand that to be in your presence at all times, we need for you to be in control of our thoughts, the meditations of our heart, and the words of our mouth. We understand that to be in your presence, to be what you want us to be, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, we need to speak words, words of grace all the time. That regardless of the circumstances and regardless of how we feel, words of grace come out of our mouth. For Jesus said, let your words be yea and nay. Anything else is of the devil. Yea to the word of God and nay to everything else. That our words should be from the engrafted word in our hearts. We should speak words of God. For in every situation of life, there is a word from God that can change your situation, can change your day, can change your life. Let us each be that person who delivers that word from God, the word that changes somebody else's life, the word that changes our own life. Let us be that person. Let each of us be that person in our world, in our household, in our sphere of influence. Let us be the person who delivers that word that changes lives including change in our own lives. And those words have to be the words of God. Words that bring grace. Words that bring God's riches. God's escape out of challenges. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. That our words deliver grace to set the people free from their own mistakes, from their own sins. For each of us, in a very real sense, is our own worst enemy. Because each of us make the choice to speak words that are not words of grace. And each of us choose to make decisions that are, that are not led by the Spirit of God. And each of us choose to either partner with God or partner with the evil one. And when we partner with the evil one, it's obvious that we are our own worst enemies. For God has said, you and I are a majority. Who can stand against you if God be for you? So on one side there is God and the things of God and the angels of God. On the other side, the devil and the evils of hell 
There are only two sides. You choose the side and you make a majority. You choose to speak words of grace and God and the armies of heaven are on your side. But if you choose to speak words of evil, words of strife, words of unforgiveness, words of hate, unforgiving words, blasphemous words, scandalous words, sinful words, then you're partnering with the devil and you and the devil make a majority. See, we've talked about you and God are a majority, but we have not thought about you and the devil are a majority. If you partner with the devil, there's nothing that God can do. God cannot, God will not go against your word. God gave you free will and God never changes. You have the free will. I have the free will to partner with the devil. And when you and I partner with the devil, we are our own worst enemy. And we are a majority. And we and God can do anything. But you and the devil, let the devil do anything in your life. It's not like you and the devil can do anything and everything. No, you and the devil, he can do everything. You give him an inch and he wants the whole ruler, the whole 12 inches. The devil wants to partner with you for a while until he has dominion over you. God wants to partner with you until you exercise your dominion over the devil. God has given you power. Jesus sacrificed his body to bring us back into jubilee. Jubilee of being restored to everything that was given to the first Adam. The last Adam came and sacrificed his body to complete the covenant, to be the perfection that Adam failed to be, to be the perfect man that God called Abraham to be. Jesus came and he was the perfect, perfect son of man. Jesus referred to himself 85 times as son of man. 85 times. He was the perfect son of man. To restore us back in Jubilee to everything that God gave to mankind and to fulfill all the promises that God had promised to Abraham. And we are here in Jubilee, living in Christ, we are living in Jubilee, restored to everything that God gave to Adam. God gave Adam what? A glorified body, a body without sin, a body that could enjoy the Garden of Eden and do whatever he wanted to do. Called to have a spouse and to have children and replenish the earth and enjoy life and enjoy the garden and fellowship with God and grow and mature in his calling till one day God could see him as a son of God as is described in Revelation 21 7 he that overcomes shall inherit all things what did Adam have the garden of Eden and authority over the earth but at that time he was in the garden of Eden his job was to expand and take over the earth which had been given to him but Revelation 21 7 he that overcomes shall inherit all things not just the earth and what moves on the earth but all things things above the earth and the good things below the earth having authority over all three things above the earth what's above the earth everything you look out to space hey God made it all it all belongs to those who are overcomers he that overcomes shall inherit all things and I shall be his God and he shall be my son so God has three kinds of sons created son Adam only begotten son Jesus 
Born again sons. You and I. But we are all growing up to be the overcomer that Adam failed to be. Adam was to protect the garden, work the garden, enjoy the garden, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. He never succeeded. So Jesus came to have all that restored to man, to you and me. That's what Jubilee is. But Adam had only one law he could transgress. Don't eat, don't eat the fruit. And he broke it. So God now has brought us back under grace. Under grace, there is no law. That's what grace means. There is no law. But sin is transgression of the law. So we can't transgress the law. We can't transgress the law because there is no law. And when we do that, which would have been a sin under a previous age, which would have been a transgression under the previous age, Jesus has already paid the price for everything. All washed away. So because Adam failed with one law, God now has set us up under grace to succeed with zero laws. Our sins washed away. And Adam failed because he didn't exercise his authority over Satan. He had authority only over the earth and the things that moved on the earth. So Satan came, not through the ear as an angel of God. Why? Because the ear, authority over the heavenlies, the air, the atmosphere, still belong to God. He had not delegated that to Adam. Satan came on the earth, moving on the earth, because Adam had authority over the earth and everything that moved up on the earth, including Satan in a snake moving on the earth. And he could have stomped him and got rid of him and done whatever he wanted to him. But instead, he put his wife above God, ate the fruit so he could die with his wife. First Romeo and Juliet. Sad ending. So God came back and restored us with everything, but better because we have no sense under the age of grace. But also, Jesus defeated Satan, gave us a new and better covenant. And among the wonderful things in this new covenant are the fact that we now have authority over the heavenlies. Jesus says in Matthew 28, verse 18, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. All power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now you go, minister the gospel. All power in the heavens and earth has been given to him. And gave us all the wonderful, glorious benefits of the New Testament of the new covenant. We're joined here with Jesus. Everything God owns, he gave to Jesus. We're joined ears. We're joined ears with Jesus. Just like if you're joined here with a checking account, either party can sign and empty the checking account. We're joined ears with Jesus. Plus he entered into a blood covenant with you. Which means, anything you need, and whatever you need that I have, is available to you, if you need it. Which means that everything that Jesus has, if you need it, if you want it, it's yours. And Jesus said, everything you have, belongs to me. That's what the blood covenant is. And so what did Jesus, what did Jesus take? What did he take that belonged to you? He took your sins. Sicknesses, disease, infirmities, poverty, pain, bruises, all transgressions, all iniquities. Not just the, not just the transgressions which produce the sins, but the iniquities, the evil things we do because we have a wrong understanding. We understand incorrectly. 
We see things wrongly, and God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They perish for lack of knowledge, but they die for breaking the transgressions. They die for breaking the law, disobedience. No, perishing would eventually get a person to die. But as you can see in the old covenant, directly disobeying the law is transgression, often lead to death in a rather short time. But Jesus bore all the transgressions and all the iniquities. And here we are now. We have everything that Jesus has. We have joint earship with them. Joint earship with them. Everything he has, we can take it. He took all the bad from us so we can take all the good from him. You all know that. He took our sicknesses so we can be healthy. He took our poverty so we can be rich. He went to hell so you don't have, you don't have to go to hell. He died so you don't have to die. For it is written, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed. And we are changed through the process of being washed by the water of the word. From milk to meat to strong meat. We are washed by the word of God like as being washed with milk. As eating milk. We are washed by the word of God as meat. Washed more thoroughly as by eating meat. And finally the goal is to be washed completely by the word such as in eating, eating strong meat. That's the progression that God wants. God wants us to move along that progression. So we have, we own everything Jesus has. And we move into its ownership as we are washed by the water of the word. As we learn and move from milk to meat to strong meat. Jesus not just gave us everything that he had, made it available to us. He even gave us his name. We have the power of returning it to use his name. And when you say in the name of Jesus, you're standing there as in the presence of Jesus, representing Jesus with all the armies of heaven behind you, backing up what you say in the name of Jesus. In my younger years, when I used to minister in an evangelistic manner, and uh, visiting many, many hospitals, many, 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 many miracles, signs, and wonders, people would say to me, when you say that this person will be out of the hospital off a deathbed and be woman three days or four days or five days, are you saying because God told you? Is God doing it because you said it? And my answer was, I don't know the answer to that. And eventually I started saying, it doesn't make any difference. We have the power of eternity to use the name of Jesus, and in the name of Jesus is all the power there is. And heaven backs up the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Death, sickness, poverty, calamity, every knee must bow to the name of Jesus. And some bow immediately, and some will bow in a while. But eventually, every knee will bow to the name of Jesus. So we have the power in the name of Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. So as we pray and as we believe, our prayer and our belief requires action of faith, which we call a faith action plan. So when you stop to see the scripture that says, 1 Corinthians 2.16, you have the mind of Christ. When you believe that, 
And when you pray, such as with an affirmation, in the name of Jesus, I have the mind of Christ. We believe that when we say it, God's promise becomes available to us. It's done spiritually. That once we pray, and an affirmation is a form of prayer. It's more prayer of declaration, a prayer of authority, a prayer of calling things that be not as though they are. But it is a prayer. Therefore, once you say it even one time, from then on, your faith action plan should be something such as you believe you have the mind of Christ. Then don't accept anything as yours that comes to the mind of Christ that doesn't belong in the mind of Christ. Every thought that pops into your head, every thought, every image that pops into your mind that does not belong in the mind of Christ, by definition cannot be yours, for you by faith have the mind of Christ. So you renounce it and you reject it. And as you do that, your mind life, your mental life will change. The committee will disappear. The rehashing of things, I would, the would have, should have, could have demons will go away. The, the bad nightmares, scary nightmares, ones that make you uncomfortable, sinful nightmares will all go away. Anxiety, fear and worry will leave your mind. Your mind will become a place of peace and joy and patience. Because that's how the mind of Christ is. So he's given us the mind. We have the mind of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We have the word of God. We have the armor of God. We have everything that God gave to Jesus. God dwells in your spirit. Scripture says, let Christ dwell in your heart by faith that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The Spirit of God lives in your body as his temple, and the Spirit of God lives on you. You're saturated to overflowing with God and his word. That's what God wants. He just didn't want to walk with Adam a few hours a day. He wanted to be partner with Adam Adam being his temple. Remember God said to Moses, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among my people. Build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among my people. From walking with Adam to worshiping God on the mountain to a sanctuary, a tabernacle, to the temple of Solomon, to the temple the last temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed. To you being the temple of God. God is very serious about you being his temple. From the beginning, all the way through to the book of Revelation, he talks about you being his temple. that his presence would always be up in you and his presence would always be in you. And so, he's given us all these, I call them sacraments, all these wonderful Blessings that move us from level to level, from glory to glory. First, of course, I got the five baptisms, for example. When you're born again, you are born again, you're living in Jesus. You have accepted Jesus as your Savior, and you've put on Christ. You're living in Jesus, with Jesus as your Savior. But then you're supposed to live in Christ, baptized in Christ. And that happens when 
You see, Jesus as your Lord. That whatever he says you want to do. In fact, you want to go to, to the point where when it says God will give you the desires of your heart, you go to the point. With Jesus as Savior, you see him as Jesus giving you the desires you have in your heart. Maybe a job, maybe wealth, maybe success, maybe health. But as you move from Jesus as Savior to Jesus as Lord, as you move from being baptized in Jesus to being baptized in Christ, you move to the point where you start thinking, God, you take your desires and you put the, your desires in my heart and then I speak out your desires. So when I say give me the desires of my heart, I mean take your desires and put them in my heart. And we start changing. We start learning to do in business to do that which God is blessing. Instead of starting a project and saying, God, could you bless this? No, you say, God, what are you blessing? What do you want me to do because you're going to bless it? We start putting God as the head of the procession rather than jumping in to the lake and then halfway across we decide, well, you know, uh, maybe I chose to swim a lake that's too far and so now you start calling for help. Instead, you go down and say, okay, where should I swim? Or maybe run down to the lake's edge and you jump in a canoe and you start paddling across and halfway across you find out there's a hole in the canoe. And you start praying for God, God, help me to get to the other side with this hole. Help me to fix this hole. But a better way is do what God is blessing. Ask him, which canoe would I take? He'll surely tell you to take the one that has no hole. And that's the way we want to live our lives, being led by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God will lead you and you'll hear His voice proportionately to how much time you spend in the Word. Plus, not just how much time you spend in the Word, it's how much time you spend in the Word, plus how much of the Word you allow to wash you. Because it's all about being washed by the water of the Word. Moving from being born again to being a church without spot or wrinkle. When we are born again into the family of God, we are children of God. And as newborn babes, we should desire the milk of the Word. We all know that. But I'm going to give you a perspective you've probably never thought about before. When you're born again, your spirit is recreated, born again into the family of God. You're a new creation. It says all things have passed away. Not some things. All things have passed away. And you're feeding in milk. So when you're born again and your spirit is recreated, what you are is a babe feeding in milk. But we're supposed to feed on the Word and grow from milk into meat. The meat of the Word which you make your own. The meat of the Word which you not just read, but allow it to wash you and make it your own is called the engrafted Word. So you move into the Word of God and you engraft it into yourself. And James 1.21 says, The engrafted word will save your soul. So you're born again, you're a baby. When you're feeding on meat, your soul is being set free. Born again, you're a baby in the family of God. Born again, you're a baby in the family of God, feeling or not. Feeding on the Word, and the Word wa washes you and washes you, you come to the point where you're feeding the Word, and the Word has set your soul free, or is setting your soul free. So the purpose of milk is for babies who've been born again. Those who are born again, all babies. Milk is for those who are recently born again, babies. Meat is for those whose soul 
are getting set free. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, you are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. Spirit is born again, feeds on milk. Feeding of meat is affecting the soul, setting the soul free. But we're supposed to go from meat to strong meat. Hebrews chapter 5, last few verses. Feeding on the strong meat. For strong meat belong to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to know good and evil. So we go from meat which is affecting our souls to strong meat which is affecting what? Our bodies. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, born again, milk. Soul getting set free, meat. Body getting set free, strong meat. Three parts, three types of word, three levels of word, matching the three parts of your being. Spirit, milk. Soul getting set free, meat. And grafted word sets your soul free. As your soul gets set free, your health and your prosperity follows. Third John 2. Prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. But now, when your soul is prospering, we need to get the body set free. The body, after all, is what caused Adam to sin. When we are Christians and we are living in the Spirit, there is no condemnation. Romans 8.1 there is therefore no condemnation to those believers who walk in the Spirit. Verse 8-2 For the Spirit of the life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life. Romans 8-2 the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So Romans 8.1 There is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. And it goes on to explain what, uh, walking after the flesh is walking carnally. And if you walk carnally, you will die. A Christian who walks carnally will die. But when your heart is set upon Jesus, when your life is built around God and His Word, then you're walking spiritually. We all live in a carnality. We all have to do carnal things. Carnal things by themselves are not sins. I mean, a lot of carnal things are not sins. Eating, drinking, sleeping, having a nice bed. These are not sins. Money, not a sin. A love of money is a sin, but not money. When your life is focused on the love of money, focused on carnal things, yeah, those Christians will die. But here in ABC, you're all focused on being alive and remaining when Jesus returns. Wow, that's all spiritual. Mm -hmm. So you fall into the flesh and make mistakes. That's why you're under grace. It's all washed away. All washed away. But notice, the Christian who is walking in the Spirit is being obedient to the leading of the Spirit, not to the leading of the flesh. Not to the flesh and must know what of the carnal things to which he or she is exposed, which of these carnal things are good and which are bad, which are sinful and which are not, which one will lead to death and which one won't. And must know that if you have some ice cream, it's wonderful, but if you have too much ice cream, it can be a sin. As you practice to manage the carnality, to evaluate everything in life using the Word of God. You grow to where you're moving into strong meat for strong meat belongs to those who by reason of use have exercised their senses to know right and wrong, good and evil. So it is the movement of your body 
the management of your body, the consecration of your body, the discipline of your body, that's moving us into strong meat. For strong meat belongs to those who by reason of use, you must be doing it, have their senses exercised. Senses exercised. What are the senses? There are five senses. They're all carnal. They're all in the body. They have the senses exercised to know good and evil. The spirit is led by spiritual thing and by the word of God, spoken and written. It's not led by senses. Your mind is what's led by senses, or at least your mind is where the sensory input ends up in your mind and your brain. And then you have to take the Word of God and evaluate it. Is this bad or is this good? Is this person bad or is this person good? Is what this person doing good or bad? Not just based on what you think, but what the Spirit of God thinks. Because you and I only have limited knowledge. And what is good today may be horrible in the future. And in, the, in these ending days, we want to live God things. Not just good things, but God things. We want our words to be God words. We want our actions to be God actions. We want everything, every project be a God project. Not a good project. Good project Good things are going to lead many, many Christians into dying. God things, God projects will keep us focused on when Jesus returns. So, we're born again, our spirit is born again, feeding in milk. Spirit, feeding in milk. Meat for the soul, setting the soul free. But strong meat is so getting the body set free to be able to use our five senses based on the leading of the Spirit of God, based on the Word of God, so our senses are exercised to know good and evil, to recognize good and evil. How are you going to recognize the Antichrist when the rest of the world doesn't is by having your senses exercised to know good and evil. How all these miracles are going to happen from the false prophet, from the Antichrist, from minor, small, uh, uh, from minor false prophets. All these miraculous spiritual things that are going to happen in the ending days, in the very near future, starting already. It's only by having your senses, your five senses exercised to know good and evil. It's only by having your body being washed by the strong meat of the word. The strong meat to get your body to be a holy temple set aside for holy God. So that spirit, the soul that's been set free and the body that's been washed to be a holy temple all come together as one being a church without spot or wrinkle a holy temple without blemish. That's what God wants. That's how you dwell in His presence. That's how you can speak grace. That's how you can live in His glory. That's how you're just walking in the room can change the atmosphere of the room and demons charge you. Every single ABC, when you walk in a room, demons should leave that room immediately. That should be a cry of your heart. That you're so washed by the water of the word. That your soul has been so set free by the meat of the word. That your spirit, man, is so in tune with the word of God that your, your outer man is so built up on the strong meat of the word, so washed by the water of the strong meat of the word that you have your body in discipline. And as you move in that righteousness that God has said, you are in right stand with me. 
1 Corinthians 5.21. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And Romans 6.15 says, Take that righteousness that's in you, and elsewhere, take that righteousness in you, and work it out into your being as holiness. The process of working that righteousness out, out into your being as holiness is the process of going from a baby feeding on milk to a son of God, well, to, to a son of God feeding on straw or meat to a overcomer, an adult son of God, an overcomer, feeding on strong meat. And the feeding on the meat is being washed by the water of the word. It's preparing your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. A part of the armor of God. That as you read the word, you let it wash you. What am I doing that the word says don't do? And you stop it. You're washed by the word. You've prepared your feet for a new direction. A direction that does not include those sins and those bad habits that you used to tolerate. All those bad friends or acquaintances or the things you used to do. You're washed as your feet change direction. Your feet are being prepared by the living word of God. By the life in the word. And you're moving on a new direction. And as you move on the new direction, wisdom comes to you and you know that he who saves soul is wise and that we should not die but live to declare the works of the Lord, to tell people about it. So as we're going in a new direction, we let ourselves prepare. What are we going to tell people that we see? We heard this lesson. What wonderful thing in this can I teach somebody? And let me tell you, if you're not jotting down some notes in every single sermon that you hear, you're not preparing your feet with the gospel of peace. You should come to every service with paper and pen or pencil. And even if you jot down one line or one question or one scripture, you've started in that direction. Because I tell you, you cannot have absorbed seven and a half years of school and have it in your head. And I tell you that when you write it down, you're triggering the three primary modes that we learn. You're hearing it, you're seeing it as you, as you write it, and you're feeling it as you write it. You're triggering the auditory, the visual, and the kinesthetic modes of learning. You're getting three for one. If you're sitting there hearing, all you're doing is learning by hearing. And I tell you, most people are visually oriented. And if you're visually oriented and you're trying to learn by hearing, you're not even getting as much as an auditory person will. But you can have all three. All it takes to get a piece of paper, be ready to write down. Here's what I'm going to stop doing. If you go through every sermon, every lesson, and write down one thing you're going to stop doing, and one thing you can teach somebody. If you walk away, and all you have in your notes are two lines or two scriptures, you've made a giant step forward. We talk about putting on the armor of God. And many people do it symbolically. I gird up my loins with truth. And I put on the breastplate of righteousness. And I shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And I put on the helmet of salvation. And I take the shield of faith. And I have the sword of the spirit. It's a wonderful way to visualize it. It's a wonderful way to learn what they are. It is not a wonderful way of living it. You live it by doing it. Faith requires works, and the works is to do it. And I'm telling you, because I love you, come to every meeting with a piece of paper and a pencil. Try to write down at least three things. One thing you're going to stop doing. One thing that you're going to let the water of the Lord wash you. One thing you're going to share with somebody. Your spouse, your children, your parents, 
your next door neighbor, the guy you work next to. And one question, one question that you want to research on your own. If you can write down those three things, you're well on your way to moving from milk, feeding for the spirit when you're a baby, through meat for the soul to strong meat for the body. Remember, it's strong meat that gets your body set free. Remember, it's your body that gives you right and authority over the world. It's the body why Jesus became man and was born as son of man. The body is what gives us the legal right to be on earth and to minister on earth. You wonder why the people don't come back from heaven and minister the gospel? Because they haven't got their bodies. You wonder why Satan is an alien and doesn't belong here? It's because he's a thief that came in and stole the authority from Adam. He doesn't belong here. And he's a thief that, means, that has been found out and defeated. But you belong here. You have the right to be on earth. You're born again. You have a body. Now, let's take the strong meat of the word and get our body shaped up. You know, when you look at the seals, and they're doing seal training, they're not sitting in classroom studying and working. They're not reading stuff about being seals. They're out there getting their bodies in shape. So in the time of need, they can recognize the good, recognize the bad, know who's going to try to kill them and who's not, and how to use their weapons. I guarantee you, they can take all their weapons apart in the dark and put them back together. I guarantee you, they know where to find their weapons. You need to know where to find your weapons. At least the ones you, you use the most. Some of them, some you do know. I would imagine every ABC knows where to find First Peter 2.24. Philippians 4.19. John 3.16. But let's see if we can start increasing that. And don't say, well, you know, you have trouble memorizing things because you have the mind of Christ. And we're talking about writing down three things for service. Something you're going to stop doing because it's displeasing to God. Something you're going to share with somebody else. And a question. Well, God was talking to all of us here. I recognize that he's talking to me. I hope you recognize he's talking to you. So remember, we want to go from children to adults to overcomers. We want to go from milk to meat to strong meat. Let's train ourselves, let's train our five senses to know how to recognize evil and to know when evil is coming up. There's a lot of visual evil in the world I watch some television, not a lot, primarily the news. Half an hour the news every day is my primary goal. Sometimes we watch a, sh a show after that during the course of a meal. Uh, but I've learned when to look away even before things pop up that I shouldn't see. My senses have finally been trained to be aware of what's coming and avoid it. And I believe that's more and more true. As I go places, I believe fully that God is not going to lead me into a place where there's danger unless he's told me in advance that he wants me to go there for a particular reason. I believe that's true for each of us. I don't think any ABC are going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We all want to be where God wants us to be all the time. So, Thank you for listening. God bless you all. I pray in the name of Jesus that the word spoken tonight will take root in my heart 
and the heart of every person who heard it and bring forth much fruit, much fruit, much fruit to help us to prepare more and more to be alive and remain when Jesus returns. In Jesus' name, amen. Words of wisdom from on high, disseminated to each and every one of us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Why don't we partake of communion now, and let's make a declaration to the Lord that we will pay attention to the things that he shared through Pastor Joshua this evening, and that we would like to be, as always, hearers and doers of the word. But we all have this wonderful goal of being alive and remaining when Jesus returns. But it's not going to happen by itself. It's not going to be automatic. We have to apply ourselves. We have to press in one step at a time, step by step by step, pressing in closer to Jesus keeping our eyes fixed on him, putting up barriers on either side of us that we see not what's going on on either side. For it has no importance to us. What is important is Jesus and the word of God and our focus on him and our focus on how we get from here to our goal. So let's take our elements of communion. Jesus has so graciously given us this opportunity to do in as many times as we want to do it. What a wonderful gift. So Father, we just thank you that all of our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus into the sea of forgetfulness where you Abba Daddy, choose to remember them no more. We thank you, Lord, that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. He blessed it, he broke it, he said, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And what is it that we're supposed to remember? That we have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. That healing is the children's bread. It belongs to us. We are the healed of the Lord, and we say so. For sickness, disease, infirmity, and pain do not belong to us. Jesus took them all. And because he took them all, we take none of them. We take our healing, our health, our strength, our life. <sighs> Restoration, rejuvenation. These are what belong to us. And we do it through partaking of the broken body of Jesus to receive our wholeness. So let's do that together right now. Thank you, Jesus. And in the same manner, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Now, the word of God says that he did not do away with the old covenant, but he came to fulfill it. But in the process, he also established with Avadadi the new, better, and everlasting covenant. And he did that just in time for us in these last days. And oh, we thank you, Jesus, for everything that Pastor Joshua was talking about, all of our weapons, all of our tools, everything we need to fight through and become overcomers. It's all right there in the Word of God. It's all right there for us through the Holy Spirit, through the name of Jesus. He has made it all available for us. All we have to do is take it, use it, and we just thank you, Lord. 
so much for all of these blessings, for this opportunity and the way that you've made plain. For Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you are the way when sometimes there seems to be absolutely no way possible. But God, but Jesus, you are that way, Jesus. We look to you and we trust you for everything. And we are so grateful for you and for all that you've done for us and for making that way for us to live victoriously and become overcomers. Thank you, Jesus. We partake now of this promise-giving and life-giving blood of Jesus Christ. Let's partake of it together now in thanksgiving, in remembrance, and in rejoicing in Jesus' name.